Hi. Good morning, everyone who's watching this from Indonesia, and also welcome for the audience who's watching this from Malaysia, Singapore, Egypt, United States, uh, Saudi Arabia, and also maybe some other countries that I haven't mentioned yet. Thank you so much for joining. It's an honor for me to host this special event today. My name is Nadira Afifa. I'm the founder of Limitless Foundation. So allow me to explain more about Limitless Foundation first. Limitless Foundation is an Indonesian nonprofit organization that is dedicated to support Indonesian students in the fight for equitable access to education. So we provide scholarship, we provide mentorship program, we also conduct a lot of events, inviting a lot of inspiring speakers from all over the world, including the one we're going to speak to today. So you can follow us on Instagram. Uh, in Instagram, uh, let me let me show you. Yeah, follow us on Instagram. It's at Limitless Program because we still have a lot of events that you don't want to miss out. So our session today will be mostly held in English, but I will also try to translate it into Bahasa because most of our participants is from Indonesia. So we just want to make sure that the conversation will be clear for everyone. Okay, we, ha we have a lot of comments already from YouTube and uh, we also have selected some participants that will join the stage to ask the questions directly to Ms. Helwa because they, they already sent the email to us with the questions. We're very excited to finally Ms. Helwa. Are you guys excited? Because in a few minutes, we're gonna invite our speaker for today's session. It's super special. It's the author of the first international bestseller, Secrets of Divine Love, the one and only Ms. Helwa. Just so everyone know, Ms. Helwa today will only be present through audio. So I'm gonna repeat it again. Ms. Helwa today will only be present through audio. So there will be no video because of the privacy and we respect her privacy. It's totally okay for me because it, um, it doesn't influence anything. We can still learn a lot from her. So I hope it's also fine for everyone. So for those of you who don't know Ms. Helwa yet or haven't had a chance to read Secrets of Define Love before, let me tell you about her. She is an internationally acclaimed, award-winning author behind the secrets of Define Love. She has inspired half a million readers with her passionate and poetic approach to holiness. She is a poet, she is a writer, and she also has a Master of Divinity in Islamic spirituality and has been writing for 15 years. And for some of you may already know her from her popular blog, Quran Quotes Daily, okay? So without further ado, please welcome our one and only speaker, Ms. Halwa. Okay, I'm gonna invite her to the stage. Um, all right. Hi, good evening, Ms. Halwa. Assalamu alaikum, Nadira. Thank you so much for having me on this beautiful program. I'm looking forward to spending some time with, um, with Indonesian readers and um, readers from around the world, but Indonesia especially has a special heart, a place in my heart, I have to say. Thank you so much, Yuselwa. Wa alaikum salam. Yeah, because uh, we have a lot of Indonesian readers and they, they are very inspired by your book. So yeah, we, we have a, uh, at least 2,000 registered participants and I believe it's already a lot of people joining us on the YouTube today. So thank you so much for the opportunity, Ms. Helwa. Looking forward to talking to you. Alhamdulillah, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Awa. So I believe it's already 7 p.m. in your place right now? Yes, in California. That's right. Uh, you're in California. Okay. In Indonesia right now, it's 10 a.m. So it's it's weekday and it's in the morning, yet people still very excited to join our talk today. So Ms. Hawa, please allow me to announce some more important things for our audience. Sure. Okay, then. So just to remind everyone, we are going to have a Q&A session with the audience later. So if you have any question that you want to ask Ms. Helwa directly, you can just write it down in the YouTube comment section. So we can definitely, definitely see your comments here from our platform. And for the best participants, we have three Secrets of Define Love and also three Petty Plus e voucher. Make sure to upload your experience of attending this event. And please upload it on Instagram and tag at Limitless Program. Okay. Okay, Ms. Helwa, uh, there are so many things that we're curious about. We have a lot of questions for you. But first, how's everything going in US right now? What keeps you busy recently? 
um everything's good here um we don't really have seasons so it's uh in california so it means nice summer season pretty much all year round um so it's been nice and i just uh recently actually finished a a journal for secrets of divine love um Mm. so wish would be out here uh, uh, looking forward to sharing that uh with readers in the coming coming months um so yeah just looking forward to uh the end of this year and in reflection inshallah we're we're really excited for that looking forward to it also so it's actually it's winter in other part of the u.s right (laughs) yeah yeah it's just here (laughs) it remains like a very even temperature for the most part um, in in california Mm -hmm. okay then all right so I believe, uh, let's get into your book, okay? So okay. I, I believe there are already like thousands or even hundreds of thousands Indonesian readers that already read your book. But just in case some of our audience here haven't had the chance to write Secrets uh, of Define Love, could you please like give a summary of what is Secrets of Define Love actually? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so this book essentially is, a, it's diving into the spiritual essence Islamic tradition. Um, growing up, I always wanted to know the deeper dimensions of the prayer um, from the perspective of the sun and the Quran. And I wanted to know why we fasted around dawn or what were some of the spiritual teachings that, that really awoke in my heart. And so I spent the last, you know, like about three years of research and writing mm-hmm. and dived into dozens of books, went around the world interview different teachers and scholars to collect the information that I was always looking for when I was growing up um, and to put it into one place where my goal was to open this book as my intention is that you would feel your heart inspired in your relationship with Allah. And ultimately the real, if I have to admit my secret desire is that people would put down this book and say, I'd really like wanna go read the Quran because I see these little quotes, a couple hundred quotes of the Quran, you know, sprinkled throughout. And it kind of, I'm ho- I, my prayer is that people would turn to the real book. Um, but essentially it's for anyone looking for inspiration in their faith um, through the Islamic tradition. Okay, sure. So it, it needs a lot of years and a lot of time to actually gather what, what's good to put, to put into the book, right? Yeah, and I think for me, you can, a lot of Islamic books tend to be, can be dry. Most, Mm -hmm. a lot of theological books are, can be dry in the Mm -hmm. sense that it's very technical. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's just good in terms of if you're studying from a scholarly perspective. But my sense is a lot of Muslims just want to have a a personal relationship with Allah. um, And they don't necessarily want all those scholarly, very, very like, intricate details but they want like stories poetry and something that would inspire their heart and so i wanted to collect that from different traditions and there's like there's science in there and there's psychology um just using the human experience in a relationship Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's very beautifully written and i saw that you've put a lot of quotes it's not only like uh from the surah in quran but also some quotes from the famous poets and also some some beautiful quotes that for me it's actually not only relevant for muslims but actually for everyone because mm. uh, i think this book is like very applicable applicable not only for the people like uh, from islam but also from like regardless of their religion and also regardless of where they're coming from because uh, i think the values that you've put into the book is like generally good values that is applicable for everyone mm. So, so may I know from your point of view, who is this book actually written for? Like, what segments of readers were you expecting? For me, that's a that's a great question. For me, it was I was very focused on the younger generation, like the teenage years. Mm-hmm. I think for me, those were the years where I felt the most confused. Mm-hmm. So I always, I, I first in the book it talks about just like feeling the prayer of someone in that age range. And later in life, I realized, I mean, later as in a few years after the book, I guess two years after the book, it it made me realize that it could have just been a prayer from my own heart 
from that mm-hmm. period in my life where I was looking desperately for a way to connect to Allah. But I felt like it was dry, like the teachings weren't as um, fertile and life-giving as I was looking for. And I, for a period of time, I felt like, well, maybe it's not Islam that has what I need. And it's only that when I really began to study the tradition, the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his followers, his family, and like all the incredible poets and scholars that came after and the prophets before the Prophet, Mm -hmm. peace be upon him, that I started to realize, no, this tradition is so rich. It's just, um, it's just been just beneath the surface. If you can get there, it's like, you'll be like, wow, this is incredible. Um, And so it is for that younger age. I think that, um, I think sometimes we we don't value the depth of the younger generation as much as we should. I think mm-hmm. teenager y- y- people in their early twenties are brilliant, they're brilliant thinkers and inquisitive. And I think we've run the risk, and sometimes in some circles of saying, "Don't ask that question, don't doubt, don't like," you, and we put that down. But really, in the Islamic tradition, is a tradition if you study it of everything is open. Come ask. That's how you learn and come be inquisitive. Um, Doubt even as a way of bringing you closer to Allah when you take your Mm -hmm. doubt and put it in his hands. So nothing is off the table, which I think is beautiful. Yeah, I I totally agree with that because when we are on younger age, we usually question everything, but there's not any occasion that we can actually find the answers because the older person always say that don't don't doubt it don't question about it just just believe but we need the reasons behind that and they can actually just answer it and maybe we can also find uh, our own answers from studying and from mm. learning from other books including this this book i think yeah because because this book is not very technical it's just something that flows very beautifully so we can learn just along the way with reading the book so thank you so much for uh, writing this beautiful book again <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, then. So um, in this book, you talk a lot about self-consciousness, about love, of course, about God, our relationship to God. Could you elaborate more from your point of view? What is actually the meaning of love itself? And like, what is actually defined love? That's a great question. Um, you know, sometimes <laughs> this can sound morbid, but I'll explain for me, love in reality is a death. And the reason I say it's a death, it, love is something, it's this indescribable thing that's beyond language, but that pulls you like the attraction of gravity, the thing that makes the earth orbit around the sun, this thing that pulls you close, this attraction. But in reality, it's its real goal is unity. And since we are these seemingly separate selves, right? That this pull of love, it really calls us to die to that separate self, to detach from that separate ego. And then the refinement of that, be in pure alignment with what Allah has asked in the unity. And so love is the thing that takes multiplicity and brings it together and and unifies it into oneness. And in that process, there is a death. There is this letting go of separation. And a lot of times for us that's difficult because the nafs, the ego, it wants to be something. It wants to stand above. And as long as you want to stand above, you are in duality because to be above, something has to be below. And to be better, something has to be worse. Mm-hmm. And so the story of the um, of Shaitan and, and Adam and Eve, right, in this realm before coming to the earth, he said, but he said, I am better, meaning he stood into duality. And because heaven, because Allah represents something of love and unity and oneness, the duality cannot coexist with oneness, just like darkness can exist where light comes. Because where light comes, darkness dissolves. And so love, when it enters, when you call upon that divine love, the secret of it really is that you can't exist where it is. You have mm-hmm. to let that self go to step in unity. <laughs> Sorry if that was a little complicated, but yeah, it's it's very deep, and I totally agree with that. So, like from from what you say, we can we can actually uh, conclude that sometimes the root causes of all the problems 
is from our ego, right? Because we feel like we we have to be better uh, than anyone, and like we 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 can actually be the first. Like we need to compete constantly. So I I also noticed when I first read the book, there's this one chapter that called ego, right? And you elaborate a lot of things from that chapter. So can you maybe for for people that haven't had a chance to read the book, can you elaborate more about what you deliver through that chapter that called ego? Yeah, sure. It's a good question. You know, I think in the book I talk about ego, E G O, representing like edging God out, mm -hmm. like it's this. You say like arrogance is. Um, a staple of the ego and so when you think about the shaitan right it says i am better mm. really if 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 i say i am worse it's also arrogant and a lot mm. of people say what do you mean what do you mean i'm worse is arrogant and i say because it's like going into a gallery and going up to the price of a beautiful masterpiece of a painting and telling the artist that it's overpriced Mm -hmm. overpriced so when we say when we say i am worse it's like we're telling allah what we're worth mm -hmm. and allah is the one that gets to decide what we're worth and he says our worth is what one life is the price of all of humanity it's as if you take one life unjustly it's as if you've killed all of humanity allah is saying to you that your life is worth billions mm -hmm. But humanity, that means billions upon billions upon billions. Really, in reality, your life is priceless. So how dare you say I am worse? Or how dare you say I'm better? Because when you say I'm better, you're saying somebody else's life is worth less. Mm -hmm. And so the ego, in a sense, is this veil before your perception of God. Mm -hmm. It's an illusion um, that you are the separate entity. We don't, in Islamic tradition, we don't believe that we are Allah, that's Allah. And we believe that without Allah, we would cease to exist. Mm -hmm. That where there is life, where there is creation, there is a fragrance of this formless divinity. Because nothing can exist without him continuously sustaining us. And mm -hmm. so in the refinement of the ego, which is part of the Islamic tradition, is to refine your ego mm -hmm. from that um, desire searching self to the mm -hmm. reproachful self to finally the contented self mm -hmm. that's so much mine like now you are contented it's the journey of refinement mm -hmm. and in doing that really the, it's, it's so beautiful because Islam surrender you surrender your ideas of who you are and in the place of that surrendering you, you receive who Allah sees you to be who he created you to be and so this is the path and the path of remembrance of the tawbah, repentance, and the spiritual practices that we've been are very tuned in to refine you, to become the greatest version of you. It's like polishing the mirror until like fully reflect the divine light that is being cast on us in every moment. Thank you so much for, again, the beautiful words, Ms. Halwa. I think a lot of people like uh, already but the comments here say that uh, they're very touched by your words and truly blessed while reading your every single word. Thank you so much for that. And like, um, I think still about ego, like speaking of ego, you have purposely chosen not to publicize yourself, right? I don't mean to like generalize people, but usually when you publish a book, when you became an author, an international bestselling book other of course you want your book to be famous but sometimes you also want yourself to be famous you want people to know your name you want people to know your uh your face your daily life but you're different so may i know why you have chosen to do that sure yeah that's a it's a good question i think that for me it feels like the guidance is so you know when I have, I have authors I love and I will travel to go see them. Actually, this, this, um, this winter, I mean, <laughs> winter, this December, I'm going to go visit, go out of, to a different state just to visit an author I love. So I get that feeling of wanting to know and wanting to learn deeply from, from someone that I look up to. And when I was praying about this book and 
I, I, I say in the introduction, like how incapable I felt and continue to feel in sharing this message, but that I could feel the blessing of Allah, the mercy of Allah, the kindness of Allah, and the thought that somebody would look at this book and say, this is this way because you, because of you, it terrifies me. And I want everyone to know that whatever, if, if there's something beautiful that comes from this book, it's because Islam is such a beautiful tradition mm -hmm. that the prophet, peace be upon him, is a complete legend. You know, he's this amazing, incredible role model of mercy, the deepest mercy that you can imagine, the kind of mercy that makes you water inside. It's, that's the tradition. There is no, like, I'm not coming up with these ideas. They're not new. Nothing in this book you'll read is new. It may sound new to some ears, but if you actually go to the tradition in the books, you'll find that it's new. It's just new because it was buried in, in different books. And so I just, I think I want all the energy that anybody would have ever inclined towards me to just go towards prayer or, or, or ultimately Allah, inshallah. Sure. Yeah. So, so like you just want readers to know that these ideas on the book, it's actually not yours. It's not new. And if you want to know more about these ideas, you should look up to, to Allah, to, to Quran, not to you, not to Miss Halwa, right? Right. Absolutely. And I think for a lot of readers, like to remember, the tradition is. And this is just a bits and parts, parts and summaries of how rich it can be. So for every paragraph that you, you're like, wow, I want to know more. I'm telling you, there's so much more. And in the beginning of the book, I say something like, I felt like a lot, like just this guidance. It's like that Allah is gonna write this book through me. And people were like, what do you mean by that? I'm like, what I mean by that is we can do nothing without Him, and to be acknowledging. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a messenger. I'm a nobody. But the reality is Allah is speaking to us in every moment, every single one of us. And if we can just be silent enough, we can we can hear his presence. And and I have to just say something really quickly is a lot of times people say, you know, actually there's this um, famous reporter, Dan Rather, and he interviewed Mother Teresa. He's like, a famous, you know, activist in Calcutta, and she was a nun. And he asked her, you know, when you pray, um, what do you say to God? And she said, I and he said, okay, well, what does God say to you? And she said, he listens. And he said, what do you mean? You listen, he listens, who's speaking? And she said, if you understand this, I can't explain it to you. Because in the reality is, in every moment, is both speaking and listening to us simultaneously. Mm -hmm. That in every moment that he's with us, in every step that we take, that nothing can happen without him. Mm -hmm. That we're all in this incredibly beautiful, if we just pause for one second, notice that the reason we, that I, me and you are, but we're not trying to breathe, that we're being breathed if you can say like and that the oxygen is this, every time we breathe in science will tell you that you take atom of a breath that the prophet took or jesus took or the dinosaurs took that we're so interconnected you know mm -hmm. and truly nothing comes that everything is something that allah has constructed maybe using our hands or, or our minds but it's the very Mind he gave up. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much. So Allah, Allah always listens. We, we, in fact, we always communicate with Allah every time. Everything we do, every time we, we wake up, we breathe, we always communicate with Allah, and Allah always listens. Okay. Uh, so Miss Hawa, I think there's some problem with this sounds. We, we cannot really hear you clearly. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah, we can we can hear you better now. Okay. Okay. Okay, we'll continue that. Okay. So, uh, I just want to remind everyone that um, 
we can we will have the q a session with the audience later so if you have any questions that you want to ask miss halwa you can just write it down in the youtube comment section we already selected some of the participants that can join us on the stage but we can also read your questions from the youtube comment sections okay uh i think there's only like a few questions from me because uh right now after this we are moving on to the q a session with the audience um, on the back of the book, it says that uh, this book will help you overcome your negative inner critic. What did you mean by that? Good question. I believe that we all have these voices in our minds. You know, not this, you know, I'm not saying like a schizophrenic voice. <laughs> I'm saying, you know, a voice of a parent, a mother, a father, um, a caretaker, or ourself that puts us down sometimes mm -hmm. that says we're not enough that we, we won't we're not lovable that we that there's something bad with us and i believe that the islamic tradition it confronts and challenges that voice mm -hmm. it, it it when we really understand who we are who allah created us to be we will know that we are always enough not because of something we did or did not do, but because Allah created us and he's perfect. And even though our creation through our actions and choices, we can make imperfect choices, but Allah created us perfectly that way. And so it's challenging that inner critic by reminding you who you are, that you are a chosen creation of Allah, that he literally, it's kind of, it's almost like, um, it gives me goosebumps to think like Allah literally he picked every little eyebrow he put in your above your eyes. He picked your eye the color of your eyes, the pigment. He chose the color of your skin, light, brown, dark, the color of your lips. He he with intention. He clothed the bones with flesh like so intentionally. And so I'm hoping that when people read about the beauty of who they are that that voice will be challenged and, and there's practices at the end of the chapter that i think incrementally begin to challenge that voice too inshallah okay sure so, so it's totally uh, normal for everyone to like sometimes listens to their negative inner critic but uh, if you're grateful enough you can finally challenge that inner critic and you can be confident of being who you are, right? Inshallah. I mean, okay then. Um, so I think it's almost two years since the first time you released Secrets of Divine Love to the public, right? It's it's released on uh, February 2020, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So I I got a lot of good reviews. It, it got a lot of good reviews. I've read it, and a lot of people even gave five stars to it. So have you been aware of what people are saying about your book? And what do you feel about that? Yeah, I, um, you know, I was amazed. I was amazed and continue to be amazed by the reception of the book. And then there's a part of me that's, that's not amazed because it's the Quran. I mean, there's so much in the, of the, in the book that's the Quran. There's so much in the book that's the Hadith, like the prophet, peace be upon him, words alone is enough to amaze. And then the Quran and teachings and sayings from followers and the family of the prophet, it's that alone without even any of my words in it alone would be amazing, you know? So I think I credit that a lot. And I think that there's something to be said about the light of Allah's words. It's like whenever uh, it was hard to explain something knowing that you could go to the Quran and you would find something in it that was perfect. Even if it was a prayer and it seemed unrelated to the topic, but something about that prayer just it gave you just enough light to be able to make sense of something. And so in a sense, like I'm completely um, surprised that I was chosen to write this book because I think anybody could have wrote it, written it. I'm just amazed by that. I'm grateful for that. I because, and I think one of the things to say is, I am intimately um, in connection with my incapability as a writer, as a um, researcher. I know my lack. 
lack in my inabilities. That's why it's all the more amazing to me because I can see what I'm capable of. And so I can intimately see how many times Allah stepped in and how often he, his mercy filled in the gaps, whether it was bringing someone of deep knowledge or bringing a life experience. I can see that. And for that, I'm grateful. And the words that people offer, I'm always reminded that what we say about others is really just the reflection of what's inside of us. And so in that, when I read these beautiful reviews, I'm just reminded of how many beautiful people there are in the world. And I'm happy that they're connecting with their faith in the way they've always carried, but maybe didn't access before. So I say Alhamdulillah for that. You, you've been very humble because you're you're absolutely a very good writer. You've been writing for 15 years and like you, you can collect all of these beautiful words and make it into a very beautiful book. So I think you, you are a very good writer. And I believe this is your first book, right? Yes. Wow, that's that's super awesome. Yeah. I, I hope I hope there will be another books in the future, but let 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 us talk about it later. For right now, we already uh, come into the Q and A sessions with the audience. So uh, we have some participants that uh, already joined us in the backstage. Uh, for the first one, I'm gonna call uh, Mr. Farhan to join us on the stage and deliver this question directly to you, Ms. Halwa. Okay, so I'm gonna invite Ms. Farhan, Mr. Farhan, sorry, wait. Yeah, okay then. Hi, Mr. Farhan, please. Thanks. Hi. Okay, Assalamualaikum. Alaikum salam. Yeah. Okay, I, I was amazed uh by your book uh the first um i'm not yet reading your book but i skimmed through the social media and seeing your book is very wonderful it's it's very amazing to read this inspirational book which research our iman our faith in islam and and after i read a few lines from it I became more aware about the amazing from the Quran and the amazing how God created us and made us feeling more worth and not worthless, worthless at all. Okay, and my question is, I want to know what is the obstacles that you face until the book is published because I know there is so much difference in culture and point of view in there, in California, especially. And I want to hear about what is what is the most uh, drive, uh, what is the most motivation that drive you wrote this? And maybe that's my questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Nadira and Ms. Halwa. That is. Thank you, Brother Farhan. Thank you so much for your question and your kind words. I would say that one of the main obstacles in writing this book was actually um, choosing what to share because there's so much. The Islamic tradition is so vast. And so for every chapter, sometimes I would have 100 pages of notes. And so it was difficult sometimes to discern what to share. But connecting that to the second part of the question, which was maybe the motivation of what helped me to strive in writing this book, is my eyes were really on a boy or girl, 14, 15 years old, somewhere in the world, who is looking for a connection with Allah, who didn't feel good enough, didn't feel like they, they just felt bad, like they didn't know how to have a connection with God. And, and so my eyes were on him and her. So when I would really struggle, I would tune in and I say this, it sounds strange for you, but it's very strange for me too, because I've never had an experience where I felt someone's prayer for something that I was written to be a part of creating. And I would feel that and it would feel me because it would remind me of how powerful that prayer was. And so that's why part of, that's the secondary reason why my name's on on the book is because I feel like the prayers made for a book like this 
is like owns part of this book you know and that it, that fueled me it, it energized me to like get past the obstacles of wor- having work and trying to find time to write this book and and so the real motivation became hope hoping inshallah that i could be a part of the answer of a prayer and since then it's really remarkable because i was a very strange paragraph to put in the book but since then i've received probably dozens of messages of people just saying you know i made that prayer and it reminded me that we're so much more connected as a human race than we think if we're just willing to just step into what the guidance or where we feel drawn to and um so the obstacle then became less and less because my eyes were on who i was writing for for the sake of allah with my eyes on this audience and so then the, all the information that I couldn't decide between it condensed because it helped me knowing who was going to end up with the book. So, Ms. Helva, if I can add another question, how many pages were, were it actually supposed to be? Oh, um, and that went through a lot of different renditions because I actually had different chapters and Actually, one of the reasons I began this project self-publishing is because mm-hmm. I was told that publishers wanted the book to would want the book to be about half the size. Mm-hmm. So, um, if it was published, you'd probably have half the content in your hands. <laughs> but um, it and that's one of the reasons, to be honest, I wrote this journal is because I went back through every chapter and asked the questions that I would ask my friends in reflection about Islam and my relationship to law and and added more stories and actually in the journal there's more a few personal stories um of ways that I came to understand like the meaning of hajj and um the Quran and some relationships with death um so yeah so I I always like I'm like oh I want to I just want to add one more chapter can I change the book can I add more so inshallah that just means that there'll be another project in the future if Allah wills sure excited to hear that okay thank you so much Mr. Farhan all right we're gonna invite um right now we're gonna invite Miss Sawidia uh right uh, okay hello I'm so sorry I'm at work so I cannot uh, turn on my camera uh, no Waalaikumsalam. I want to ask, like, uh, I always think that I have to change the world, but I push aside the importance of, like, changing someone's world. So your book has brought me to think many perspectives about Islam, and definitely you changed my whole world. So uh, how does it feel to change someone's world in a good way? Does it make you more believing in God's power to create destiny, like, the destiny is you change someone's world. Like I'm very grateful. Uh, I'm very grateful that I read your book. Like I'm, I'm literally crying right now. <laughs> mm. I cannot believe that I found this that led me through my tough times at this year. And I'm so thankful. Thank you. Thank you so much for your. Um, just genuine message and kind words. I can feel the sincerity of your heart. And I think in this moment, that like purity, it changes my world too. And everyone on this call, because when like someone is real and pure and sincere, they're in their fitra. And that's the most beautiful thing um, a heart can feel and eyes can see. And so I just wanted to say that I thank Allah for the opportunity to be able to write this book. And I just want to tell you that every time you breathe, you change the world. You just being alive, it changes the world. You literally change the air around you. And then you speak and your kindness lands in my heart and changes something in me. And so it's not always doing publishing a book or going and doing this great thing in the world that changes it. Quite often, it's the small things. 
It's the kind words. And that's why the prophet, peace be upon him, said a kind word is charity. Because it's, we, we sometimes undervalue the most simplest things. And yet they're the most profound. And when you look back at your life, you always realize it's the small things. Right? So I just wanted to thank you for the reminder of that. And um, praying for your very beautiful and sincere heart. Thank you so much. It touched me. Mm -hmm. And thank you for this opportunity, Kanadira. Thank you, Sawidya. I hope this answers your question. All right. Uh, right now, uh, we're going to invite, before moving on uh, to the questions from the YouTube comment section, we have Miss Tika to deliver the question directly on the stage. Um, all right. Please, Miss Tika. Assalamualaikum, uh, Mbak Nadira and Helwa. Assalamualaikum. Uh, yeah, so I believe this book already ch changed your life a lot. It's not only changed the life of the readers, but I believe it's also changed your book, especially with the book tour and all this fame. I wonder, uh, does this successful journey of this book impact your relationship with the divine? I mean... Uh, from the book, I got a sense that your connection with the God is very, very good, and we are so touched by the book. The, the, the actual question is that what's next? After all this good relationship, what's next? I ask the question because sometimes sometimes we, when we already achieve something, we, we kind of get lost. We don't know what's next because we, we already have what all that we wanted. So I wonder what's next for you, especially in relation, uh, yeah, related to the connection to the divine. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can tell that you are a, um, a deep thinker and it's, I'm very grateful for your question because I can feel that it's, it's very thoughtful. And I would say that I have only begun on my journey and my relationship with Allah. Um, I try to say this as often as I can, but I am a baby on the path, the spiritual path, because as someone said, they say they are like, well, you know, what is the, what is the end of the path? What's the destination? And, and then the master replied, there is no end because the beloved or Allah has no end. The journey continues in its mystery. I remember asking may sound unrelated, but I'll make the connection. I remember asking one teacher, you know, how are there different stations or levels in, in paradise? Because um, by the grace of God, if I get in and I'm in level one, right? And my mother, inshallah, is in the highest heavens. Well, I, I would like to be with my mother. So, and if heaven is a place where all my desires are met, well then, wouldn't Allah bring me and my mother together? And surely she's not coming down from the seventh heaven. <laughs> so doesn't that mean that I would go to the seventh heaven? I'm, I'm just hoping that my mom's good deeds really pulls me up. Her prayers have saved me in this life. So maybe in the next two, inshallah. Uh, and I remember asking and he said, he told me, he's like, me and you, if we stand outside in the dark sky and we look at the beautiful stars, what would we say? And I said, oh, I would say it's beautiful. And he's like, now if I brought an astronomer next to us and he looked at the same stars, what would he say? And I'm like, well, he would probably talk about the constellations and, and then the way the stars work and how the stars are birthed and how stars die. And he's like, and he's like, but we're looking at the same sky, right? And I remember thinking that now, no one knows. I mean, he does. I don't think he felt like he knew. And I definitely don't know what the levels of heaven are. But that two eyes, two two pairs of eyes next to each other could look at the same thing and see something totally different. Right. Based on what Allah has given them. And so on this path, I am such a baby. And I may be able to just look up to the sky and someone else is still looking at their feet, perhaps. But wow, is there so much sky to see and experience. And so I think the journey has just begun. If anything, I haven't achieved anything. It just begun. Even in writing a book and some people say, oh, there's this level of fame and now this. Now, for me, it's how can you serve better? If you have ears that are listening, 
is there a message that you want to say? Yes, I have a message about anxiety and depression. Yes, I have a message about grief and heartbreak. I have a message about that that Allah has given and shown me through the examples of the prophets, peace be upon them. And so the journey has just begun and it will always just begin. You know, al khidr when we realize Moses is at this high station, he's a prophet, oh my God, wow. And then Allah brings him this unnamed, you know, we say khidr, this, this guide, and it's like his knowledge is shattered. And then, in other words, it keeps going. And if for the prophet, Moses, it kept going, then I got to believe that it keeps going for us too. And every destination is really just another beginning, inshallah. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Selva, for the answer. And I hope it answers, Ms. Tika. Thank you so much for your question. All right, uh, so Ms. Selva, we're going to move on to uh, some questions from the YouTube comment section. So we have this question from Ms. Sabila and Faiza. Uh, I think it's very relevant for the younger generation for now as we live in the social media era. Could you please give us your perspective how to translate Akhlaqul Karimah in social media? What is the Islamic foundation that we can use to practice morality in today's digital world? Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I think that, um, you know, noble character or called good attitude or alignment with the Islamic teachings gets tricky sometimes online because a lot of the information that we get, we can't really curate it or filter it because of home pages and recommendations and and things like this. And so for me, it's really being like setting the intention when you wake up in the day, in the morning. One of the reasons we pray is to set our intentions. And a lot of times we pray Allah Akbar, and you just keep going, 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 and then it's done, and people are like confused what rakah they are on, and they're just like going on to the next thing of the day. But in reality, prayer is meant to pause you. In its true essence, it's meant to for you to take a breath and for you to remember who you are. And you're not this person seeking distraction. That time is so valuable that time is a gift that Allah gave you so he'll ask you how you used it just as the hands he gave you and the eyes he gave you and the ears he gave you and so first it's to remember and and sometimes this needs correction sometimes you forget sometimes you're on your phone sometimes you get distracted that's okay the re the point though isn't that you would fall into shame it's that you would turn back and say oh I was I lost track. I was forgetful. Allah says, I mean, it says in the Quran, Allah, when I forget, help me remember. I was forgetful. Now I remember who I am. And I'm not this person who wastes their time on things that don't bring or add value to my life. I'm this person that's intentional. I know for me, when I substitute phone time for reading, it's just infinite increase in the way that I walk on the spiritual path. I just, it's a total different shift. People are like, I'm so distracted when I pray because you have 15 tabs open on your phone. And we're so, we, we don't like to be bored for even one second, right? And so part of that is like, when you remind yourself who you are, it becomes easy to have an attitude or a character that's in alignment with that intention because you're reminded of what your intention is. But if you haven't reminded yourself what your intention is, it's not unlike goal setting. When you forget what goals you're trying to achieve, you miss a lot of deadlines. So when you know what your goals are, I've seen this in the financial field. The people that I know, they're like, oh, social media is such a waste of time because it takes me away from learning the things I need to to protect my family financially. But when it comes to it spiritually, we're like, ah, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a picture. It's just a video. And so part of it is just, I'm not telling you to like throw your phone out and like live in a hut in the desert. But like just be aware of who you are. 
And if you see things that aren't in alignment with who you want to be, then don't look at them. And just as you make those steps, do it gently. Because sometimes people want to make these extravagant changes and then it's not sustainable. Look at how Ramadan is such a good example. Allah knows. He doesn't say, don't eat for five days. It's too much. He said, don't eat 30 days, but every when the sun sets, you can eat. It's like teaching you, slowly refining yourself. So I would do the same with social media. If if it's not serving you, if you don't feel happier, if you're feeling more depressed, then no, like make change and stick to that. But begin with an intention. Who do you want to be today? And who did Allah create you to be? Thank you, Ms. Hawa. So I guess uh, we just have to always remind what we are and like what, what our purpose is. And if you are still active in social media, I think just surround yourself with good values in social media as well. So don't be too distracted on it. Okay. Mm. All right. So right now we are going to invite Miss Sarah Putri to deliver the question directly. Okay. Yeah. Please. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam. Okay, uh, thank you Kanadira for this amazing opportunity. Previously, I would also like to thank Kak Helwa for writing a book that has really helped me in my life. And I never thought that I would be able to share one frame with you. So thank you very much Limitless for making this program. And Secret of the Divine Love is really like a bridge that connects me with God and interprets Islam, which is very beautiful. I've only read three chapters, but it totally changed my whole life. I, and I can relate with you. You wrote, love had always been at the soul of Islam. It was only my heart that had been blind to experience of it. I can relate with that. And my favorite line is, love is not mm. something Allah does. Love is something Allah is. That's very deep. I actually cried when I read it. And while reading that, I really felt alive again. But as time goes by, the feeling of being alive seems to be fading. I don't know why. And so my question is, how do you keep that feeling going? And how can you stay close to God? And I'm sorry for not asking about authorship, but rather spirituality. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, such a You have such a joyful and beautiful spirit. And um, your question is is very beautiful. I would say, you know, it's kind of like, you know, if your battery on your phone is fading, what do you do, right? You plug it in. Islamically, salat, it means connection. Prayer is connection. So you plug yourself in to be energized with that energy. And so it's, it's not unlike, you know, when you don't take a shower every day, you start to feel dirty right? Naturally. And so it's similar with the spiritual path. It's like sometimes it's like we read something. Wow. Amazing. It's, or we hear something, we listen to something and it's inspiring. Or we listen to the song of a bird or some beautiful animal or the sound of the breeze and the trees and leaves and everything feels beautiful. And then we don't, and we lose that feeling. And then we search for it. We're like, how do I get it back or that love I felt or that I felt that deep connection with Allah and now it's not here and, and how do I get it back? And so it's such a, it's such a human question. And you know, in the, in the Quran, Allah talks about the prophet Abraham and how he tells him to take the life of his son. But really what he was saying is sever the bond that you have to him for even the inclination that you would hold him in a place in your heart that was only meant for me, your Lord. And so sometimes the things we have to ask ourselves, two things, what is draining our energy, our faith energy? And then the ways that that happens is the things we see, the things we listen to and the environments that we're in, the people we surround ourselves with. And then the other side is, what am I doing to supplement or, or fill my faith, energy, and connection with Allah? That means connect with nature, connect with yourself, connect with revelation. See, a lot of times in Islamic tradition, we only talk in modern Islamic tradition. We only talk about the Quran, 
spiritual practices, the mosque, Hajj, Ramadan, etc. All of that's valid. And Allah says, I will show you out in creation, in the universe, and within yourself, that this is the truth. Meaning the connection with the world around you, with the jungle, with the tree, with um, the, the sea, with a rock, has a, it's a spiritual practice. It could be a spiritual practice when it returns you to Allah. Or deeply connecting with yourself. When's the last time that you took your hand and you placed it on your heart? You said, thank you for beating. When's the last time you put your hand on your stomach and you felt yourself breathe? And you were reminded that there's breath going through you. Or just held your thumb and said, wow, without you, I couldn't hold things. And just had a moment of gratitude. So if you want to connect to that energy, to that connection with your Lord, go to gratitude. Be with this anything, one of your eyes. Close your eyes, put your hands on them, and remind yourself that Allah gave you sight because he wanted you to see his creativity in all that he chose to create. That in every moment that you're being met with him, the question isn't, whether he's speaking through these things, it's whether you're listening. So when you feel disconnected, be silent and listen. The world around you, inside of you, and within the tradition, inshallah. I, I pray that's helpful. Thank you so much. It really touched me. Inshallah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, uh, Miss Helwa, and also thank you, Miss Sarah. I have I have one last question from the uh, audience before we wrap up the session. I will invite Miss Berli Berliana Diaz to join the stage. All right. Oops, sorry. Okay, please, Miss Berliana. Yeah, assalamualaikum. And thank you, sister, for the opportunity. So I've read your books and. It helps me to understand Islam in another level, I would say. And then I start my journey to, you know, actually look for what Islam is. And now I start taking classes. I start, you know, looking deeper into Islam. And I feel like, you know, it's thanks to Allah and also, uh, you know, to help me to find this book. And I was able to learn from it a lot. But my question is that, you know, after some times of, learning and then you know praying and everything sometimes your iman you know fluctu fluctuates a lot and then it still relates to the previous question that when your iman is getting low and then you do you still do the obligatory prayers you still do all the things that you can do you know you don't miss your salah but your iman is still low or you feel like you know you are still too attached to this dunya so what do you do in that you know, in that case, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. And um, I'm inspired by your desire to get to know your faith more and taking the steps to learning in a deeper way. I applaud you for that. And do you really want to know the secret answer to this question? Yeah. Yeah, you really do? Okay. Of course. Um, this is something I realized when I struggle with my faith or, you know, Iman is naturally goes up and down. It's very natural. You hear that many teachers throughout time talk about that, that it's just the nature of faith. My, I don't know if you should call it a hack, but this is what it's felt like for me, is when I really struggle with my faith, I set out and try my best to answer somebody's prayer. What that means, sadaqah, or quite literally, like if I'm in a space and I see that someone is really struggling and I could feel that they're maybe scared, maybe they're a little introverted or new and they feel nervous, I like try to breathe. And if I'm in tune, I try to answer that prayer, which is for a friend. If I'm walking past something, if I hear about someone, if it's something somebody needs, I try to listen. And if I can answer somebody else's prayer, if I can be part of the answer to somebody else's prayer being answered, 
it completely revitalizes my iman. Why? Because when people pray for you, it is something beyond language. So when you're struggling, go and help someone else who's struggling. When you're in need, go and help someone else who's in need. When, you, when you're really longing for something, do your best to make that longing come true for someone else. Be a reflection of Allah's qualities of mercy, generosity, and love upon the earth. And it says, the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, Allah, show the creation mercy and the creator will show you mercy. And so make that a part of your practices when you're like to just walk outside the house. Like if you like Rumi says it one way, he says, walk out your side, your house, like a, like a lifeboat, you know, like a, like a lighthouse. You walk outside your house, say today I'm struggling with my Iman. I'm going to walk down the street or through the park and I'm going to, Allah, I'm open. You show me a prayer and let me answer it. It may be um, a squirrel. And you may just have some nuts. And that's the answer. The prophet, peace be upon him, talks about the woman who gives water to a cat. Right? Like you, So if you struggle, then make that day about answering a prayer of somebody else. It could be a creature, like an animal. It does not have to be human. But I promise to you, like, it will change your life. It has changed mine. Yeah, thank you so much for the answer. Sure. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Halwa. That's a very beautiful answer and very practical. We can absolutely apply it in our lives after this. And so, Ms. Halwa, um, it's almost an hour. It's already an hour, actually. So thank you so much for this opportunity. But this will be my last question before we wrap up the session. I heard that you are currently in the process of publishing Secrets of Divine Love in Bahasa Indonesia version. Is that true? And is there any other project that you're working on that maybe you can share with us? That is true. Actually, it's been translated. So, oh, okay. yeah, I'm not, I believe Quanta Books is, it should be available maybe by the end of this year, but if not early next year. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. It's something that I, Almost instantly after publishing it, I was looking for Bahasa translation because Indonesia is is a big part of my story. Um, I did some work in Bali and Sidoarjo and Jakarta, so I like I love it. I love Indonesian people. I love the food. I love your country. So it's the first place on this planet that I felt at home. So I have very special part of my heart for Indonesia and um, so I'm looking forward to that inshallah when this journal comes out I'm going to try to get it translated and sent to Indonesia as well and um, yeah inshallah oh that's very awesome to hear I actually got goosebumps listening to it so thank you so much that you have the Indonesia version of it I see that uh, there's a lot of comments I think there's a lot of excitement um, for your Bahasa Indonesia version. I'm sure it will be uh, a very great book as well. More people will be able to read it. So thank you so much. And it's super awesome. Again, thank you so much, Ms. Helwa, for being in our talk show. I believe this has been a very insightful discussion for everyone. Everyone is so excited. And we're waiting for your next projects. I hope everything goes well with your plans. We, we will wait for you for your another visit to Indonesia sometimes. Please inform us. And thank you so much and have a good night. Thank you so much, Nadira. May Allah have um, make everything easy on you and all the projects that you're doing. And I pray for mercy and beauty and gentleness on your path. Um, as I could feel the, the vastness of your heart, it's very special. And I pray Allah always protects you and your family. Allow me. Amen. The good wishes for you as well. Thank you so much, Ms. Helwa. And thank you so much for all of you that uh, has joined our conversation. Make sure to upload your experience of attending this event in the uh, Instagram. Okay. And tag Limitless Program to win three books and three Petty Plus e-voucher. Special thanks for our audience that has joined the stage to deliver the questions directly to Ms. Helwa. All of that was a very good questions, very great questions. And stay safe, stay healthy, and see you on the next occasion. Bye. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam.